Would you turn once again with me, please, to Philippians chapter 3? Philippians chapter 3. The verses that we want to look at this afternoon are verses 10 and 11. These are your memory verses. Let's say them. Okay, let's, let's say them. If you can't say it from memory, we can read it. Okay, That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. There are two verses that if, you know, uh, I don't know. I'm not big on life verses, but if there are, are life verses, two verses that the Lord impressed upon my heart as a, as a young man. One was Isaiah 6, 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, uh, Inani, here am I. Here am I. Send me. And so that was a surrender that I made to the Lord as a teenager. But I would uh, do what God wanted me to do. I think I was about 18 by the time I got to that point. And then once I started seriously following the Lord, he impressed upon my heart, Philippians 3.10, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection. That has been probably the motto and watchword of my life. The thing that I want more than anything else in, in all the world, and I'm serious here, is I want to know him. You say, you don't know him by now? I'm getting to know him better. And uh, I'm never going to tire of coming to know him. I'm never going to give up pursuing him. If, there, if this verse teaches us anything, it teaches us to be what I call a God chaser. God made you and I in his image. And as a result of that, our lives are all about relationships. God put us in a web of relationships. And that's why it's so important that we make the right choices, because we're in a web of relationships, and we will either open a door of opportunity to people by the choices we make, or we'll slam the door shut on them. We are people in the image of God, made for relationships. None of us are self-originating. You and I came from the uh, married love of a father and a mother, hopefully in the bonds of, uh, of marriage. We're not self-originating. Uh, we're, we're not even self-explanatory. Uh, God has seen fit that uh, no two people are alike, but he made us male and female. We, we are not self-fulfilling. Uh, there is nothing that we do that someone else hasn't had a hand in it. I don't believe that there is a person on this planet that is saved apart from someone else that was burdened for them and prayed for them or witness to them. And I believe that um, if you as a believer are going on with the Lord, if you are desirous to know him, it's because someone has prompted you. It's because someone is praying that for you and uh, seeking to bring you along. And so the fact of the matter is when the scripture says when Paul says what he does after 30 years of being a believer, approximately, that I may know him, he's obviously not talking about an intellectual knowledge. He's talking about a very personal, experiential, and intimate type of knowledge. In fact, the first time the word know appears in the Bible, I believe is in chapter 4 of the book of Genesis. And it is where we are told that Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bore a son. And so that gives you an idea of just how intimate knowledge of God really is. It's the most close, intimate relationship 
that is imaginable. And it's the most important relationship that anyone could ever have. What Paul is saying is, I already know him as my Savior, but I want to know him as everything. I want to know him as my Lord, yes, but I want to know him as my everything. I want to know him as the one who not just lives in me, but uh, that I am in fellowship with and that I cooperate with so that he lives his life through me. I want to fully experience the Christ life, as we could call it. When he says that I may know him, and then ends up saying, being made conformable to his death, he's saying two things. Not only do I want to intimately know the Lord, but as a result of that, what I want to happen is I want to become like my Lord. You know, in the first century, many rabbis, Jesus wasn't the only one that had followers. They, many rabbis, many followers, and the, the attitude of the Talmudim or the disciples, the followers of a rabbi, was they wanted to be with him 24-7, their rabbi, because they wanted to know him so that they could be like him. And of course, when you're talking about a human rabbi other than Jesus, you're talking about simply emulating or imitating. That's not what Paul's talking about when he says, I want to know Christ, I want to be made to become like him. It's, a, it's an internal change that we'll talk about in just a moment. But it's a personal, growing, intimate relationship with Jesus. And knowing Jesus better is a relationship that, uh, of course, begins initially with salvation, but it, uh, it has to be cultivated in what we talked about this morning and what is sanctification. You have to spend time with people in order to get to know them. If you don't spend time with the Lord, you don't really know the Lord very well. The more time you, the more real time that you uh, spend with the Lord, the more you'll get to know him. You don't know people unless you talk to them. You have to talk to the Lord, and you have to keep talking to him all day long. And you, you need to talk to him through your, your conscious hours, your waking hours. To get to know the Lord, you have to, like any relationship, share experiences with him. Share your likes and dislikes with him. Share your heart with a person that you want to have a relationship with, a deep one. Get to know the heart of the Lord. I think of what uh, the prophet Jeremiah says to Israel. I think it's in, in chapter 4 where he says, I remember the love of your espousals. What he meant, I remember the honeymoon love that you had for me. Well, where is it? And then John to the church in Ephesus says in chapter 2, you're a great church. You're sound in doctrine. You're very active and busy in the work of the Lord. He says, nevertheless, I have one thing against you. Just one thing. What's that? You've, you've left your first love. And I think what he means there is you've lost that honeymoon type of love for the Lord Jesus. And I want you to think about that yourself. I want you to think about, you know, some of us weren't saved in a dramatic fashion, certainly not, not the way Paul was saved, but uh, some of us had more dramatic conversions than others. Uh, some of us were saved uh, out of life of sin. Not me, but, you know, others. I was a sinner, obviously, but it, it wasn't as evident outwardly. But uh, so some people, you know, they get plucked out of a horrible life of sin and they never get over that. But I think many people, many Christians, they get saved and then they just begin to take it for granted and they lose the, the luster and they lose the, the, uh, the, that first love that they had for the Lord. They just get distracted and they get caught up with all kinds of other uh, stuff, even good stuff, Christian stuff, and yet they lose that honeymoon 
kind of love. The honeymoon's over maybe for some of us as far as our relationship with the Lord. And that's sad because if you really love someone, what you're going to find out is even though you don't know it, you're becoming more like that person. You know, the longer you spend with someone, it is like your lives just get melded together and you become more like, well, it does, it, it, it happens to some degree that way in a relationship with Jesus. But becoming Christ-like isn't something that happens automatically. If you don't cooperate, like we said this morning, you have a choice. You can either say yes to self or you can say yes to the Lord. And if you say yes to self, you're not going to be coming like the Lord. You're going to be coming more and more like yourself. And uh, that's not good. So that's what this part of Philippians 3 is about. It's about sanctification. Knowing Jesus, that's the title of our thought today, knowing Jesus is, a, is all about not only coming close to him, but becoming like him. That's our goal. That's, that should be your ambition in life. That, sh that, that should be the thing that you pursue above everything else. It'll never get old. That's what you were made for. That's what human beings exist for. If you don't have a growing intimacy with the Lord, you're bored. Uh, you're missing the point of your human existence. You really are. It really comes down to the fact that if you aren't in a focus on knowing Jesus closer, better, then you're not living up to the potential and the reason really for your existence. So I want to look at verses 10 and 11 and uh, just pick up on three things that I had uh, quickly mentioned uh, about uh, this matter of knowing Christ uh, in our morning thoughts, but I want to develop them a little bit more. Before we do, let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have once again to just meditate on these things. But Lord, we want to, as the scripture says, not just meditate upon them, but we want to give ourselves to doing them. We want to give ourselves to cooperating with you and what you desire to accomplish for us looking in the scripture. But Lord, we're not just looking at the word of God. Uh, we're looking at the God of the word, and uh, we want to know you. And so it's just not just learning the word of God. It's learning of you. So, Lord, let us read our Bibles that way. Not just a book to be studied, but a person to be known, a person to be experienced. God, touch our hearts and accomplish your purpose as we seek you. Let us truly seek you with our whole heart because you promised if we would do so, you said to Israel, you'll find me. And Lord, the greatest discovery that anyone can make is you. And so may we discover you afresh today in Jesus' name. Amen. Going back to that 10th verse again in Philippians 3, in Paul's desire, his one desire, that I may know him and as you come to know him, what he says will happen is that you will have a powerful experience. How, how do I come to that? Because he says, if I know him, I'm going to know the power of his resurrection. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus. I mean, it's unparalleled. It's incomprehensible power that brought forth our Savior out from among the dead. It's a power that he exerted that overcame all resistance. And the fact of the matter is, and this is, this is mind-boggling, that resurrection power that brought the dead human body of Jesus out of a tomb <coughs> into the realm of physical life again, that same resurrection power is inside of every single believer. That is amazing when you think about it. That power can overcome all resistance if we cooperate. Miraculous power. And it, I think it also tells us this. 
it takes that much, it takes that kind of miraculous power to transform a believing life and empower us as we depend upon Christ's resurrection life in us and through us. It's what Paul said in Romans 6, uh, where he's talking about spiritual baptism. He said, when you got saved, you were plunged into Jesus. He's, you were you are baptized into Christ, he said. And just as you were baptized into Christ, you also were raised to walk in, in a newness of life. That's the resurrection power that comes as a result of knowing Christ. You get this, this ability, this, uh, this miraculous power that can overcome all obstacles, that transforms you and, and uh, works through you, and you are able to overcome the flesh that you have to say no to. I can't say no to my flesh in my own willpower. But the Bible says that when I was baptized into Christ, I was raised to a newness of life that enables me to recognize that the old person that I used to be is dead and buried. I'm a new person in Christ. And he, for the first time, gives me the ability to say no to self. It's resurrection power. For anyone to say no to self consistently takes the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus in you. By the way, we are told in Ephesians chapter 1 that when Christ died, he rose again. And when he rose again, he ascended to the throne and he is now seated far above all principalities and powers. He's seated far above all the spirit realm, all the heavenly host. He's seated on the throne. Of, they're all under his feet. They're all defeated and under his authority if they were rebels. And he says, as a result of that, I am that, that resurrection power is in you, Ephesians 1.19. That same power that raised him from the dead and set him above all these, these spirits, the spirit realm. He, he says that power, that resurrection power. So we have power over the demonic realm as well. We have power in the spirit realm over all the evil spirits, including the, the chief demon of them all, Satan. We have resurrection power that gives us victory. And so this is what he means when he says, if you know him, you'll know the powerful life that he gives you. You'll, des you'll desire to experience this kind of life if you know him, a resurrection life. So let me ask you, do you? You know, do you know this kind of resurrection power in your life? Have you experienced it? Isn't it amazing what God would do? That that, that kind of supernatural strength, if you will, called grace, can just... It, it can, you know, pilot you and, and launch you over all your enemies and give you victory through Christ. It's powerful life. But, you know, when you look at the rest of verse 10, are you ready for this? This powerful life comes at a cost. Be nice, it was just, you know, Free. Salvation's free. Sanctification isn't. <laughs> you got to cooperate with the Lord in order for it to happen. It's not an automatic thing. Notice this. If you're going to know the power of his resurrection, you got to also agree to the two prerequisites in the remaining part of the verse. The first one is this. It's painful. Powerful, yes, but painful. You have to agree to cooperate with the fellowship of his sufferings. It's inevitable. If you are a serious Christian, and I hope you are, if you're a serious Christian, mark it down. You're going to suffer. If you're serious for the Lord, you're going to suffer. If you're not, you won't, because you'll just cave in and you'll capitulate 
to your selfish desires or to whatever pressure that others put on you. But if you're a serious Christian, you have to be willing to suffer. You have to be willing to share in Christ's sufferings, which are related to being a believer. Have you gotten the impression that believers aren't very popular in America? They're becoming less and less popular all the time, all over the world. And so the fact of the matter is, if you are serious about following the Lord, you're going to suffer for the Lord. You are going to suffer in relationship to being a believer. But Paul said, my desire is so strong to be to intimately know the Lord, regardless of any of the suffering that I that's involved. I even welcome it because, as he said in chapter 1 and verse 29, for unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. It's a privilege. That's how Paul viewed it, to suffer for Jesus. It's like the disciples, Peter and John, they come out of the temple. They've been uh, beaten uh, for their preaching the gospel of Jesus, and they, they rejoice that they've been counted worthy to suffer for his shame, for his name. And so Paul even welcomes it uh, because through this, he becomes intimate in his relationship with Jesus. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 5 that Jesus, in his earthly life, from a child to manhood, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. God uses suffering for Christ to purify our lives and to teach us how to commit our cares to him and entrust him with whatever it is that we are up against, whatever it is that we face. Remember how uh, Peter puts it in uh, 1 Peter 4.19, that we are to commit when we suffer, we're to commit ourselves as unto, uh, to God as unto a faithful creator, you know? He's, he's, he's capable. He's a faithful creator. He made us. He knows what makes us tick. He knows how to keep us. He knows how to protect us. He knows what's best for us. He's a faithful creator. And you have to believe that. So your circumstances, no matter what suffering they involve, you just trust him. And you learn to do what Peter says in the next chapter, 5, 7, casting all your care upon him. You commit to him. You commit yourself to him as unto a faithful creator. You cast all your care upon him because you know that as a faithful creator, you matter to him. He cares about you, is what he's saying. And so if you want to know Christ, brace yourself. Because if you're serious about that, you're going to suffer. You're absolutely going to suffer. If you don't like the sounds of that, You'll never become intimate with Jesus. It's just the way it is. He uses suffering to purify us. That's the way God purifies his, his people, through suffering, for him, for his sake. Let me give you an illustration of this. In the former communist regime in Romania, what was his name, Ceausescu? Something like that. That regime determined to absolutely erase and wipe out the church. No Baptist pastor at that time had any theological training. It wasn't allowed. So the Baptist denomination in Romania picked out one young man that would go to the West for training and then return, and he would train others and lead uh, the, their denomination. Well, the young man that was chosen was an, a man by the name of Joseph Song. He was sent to the UK, and uh, he knew when he left that he, when he returned, he would pay dearly for it. But he went anyway. And when he was finally finished with his theological training in England, and he was ready to return back to his homeland of Romania, one of his classmates commended him for such courage to go back and face persecution. But he also asked Joseph, he said, but I mean, what chance do you have for success? And he thought for a while, and he replied, 
Well, I suppose about the same chance of success that a lamb would have surrounded by a pack of ravening wolves. But if the purpose of the lamb is to reveal to wolves the nature of what it means to be a lamb, then perhaps that's the best way. Let the wolves eat him. You know, when I thought about that, it reminded me of what Jesus said about himself in John chapter 10, and it really is a commentary on it. In, in John chapter 10, he contrasts himself as the good shepherd with the, hired, the hirelings, uh, the shepherds of Israel that were in it for what they could get out of it personally. And Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I give my life for the sheep. Jesus came to reveal what God is like to a sinful world, and the only way that he could do that was to let the sheep eat the shepherd. Not the wolves, but let the sheep eat the shepherd. The good shepherd is devoured by the sheep. And in symbolism, we pick that up every time we observe the Lord's Supper. We're eating the shepherd. We're devour as the sheep, we're devouring the shepherd. <clears throat> if you're going to know Jesus intimately, it's going to involve pain. It's going to be a painful experience because serious Christians suffer because that's the way God purifies us, and that's the way that the Lord shows himself and reveals himself through Christians that are willing to suffer at the hands of wicked people. There's a third point that I want to make, and also a by there's a second um, a, a, a second prerequisite to knowing Jesus. Not only is it painful, but also it's very practical. Look at what he says there in verse 10. And being made conformable unto his death. Here's the practical aspect of knowing him. That is, to be made conformable to his death, as I said a moment ago, is becoming like him. To be made conformable to his death. The word conformable, it has one of the root, uh, one of the roots in that original word is the word that we get our English word metamorphosis from. But what he's saying here when he says being made conformable unto his death, he's talking about an inward metamorphosis or transformation in a person's experience to something, in this case, to Christ's death that we have an inward transformation inside we die like Christ. We die to ourselves is what he's talking about. So before you can experience the powerful resurrection life of Christ, you have to be willing, and it's in this tense, you have to be willing to keep on dying. It's not a one-time deal. You have to be willing to keep on dying uh, to your self-life in all the various forms in which it reveals its ugly head every day and throughout the day in you. It's in a present passive tense. In other words, it is him that, uh, that you cooperate with, and he enables you to die to yourself. In the several times that the Gospels talk about Jesus giving this direction, if any man will follow me, let him take up his cross. If he's going to follow me, let him take up his cross, deny himself, take up his cross, meaning die to your own ambition, die to your own desires, die to your own directions, die to your own will. Let him take up his... Luke 9.23 says it this way. Jesus says, let him die daily. And I would say moment by moment is what he meant, that you make a personal choice to either live a self-filled life, listen to me, or a spirit-filled life. Either a self-filled life or a spirit-filled life is a choice that we make all the time, every day, throughout the day. Am I going to be filled with myself or am I going to be filled with the Spirit? This is what it means to be conformed, uh, made conformable, as he says here, unto his death. Because only then 
Will the powerful resurrection life of Christ be evident and expressed through you? It is that daily, moment by moment, personal choice that you make to either be self-filled or spirit-filled. There's a little chorus, only two choices on the, on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. There's no in-between. Now look at verse 11. So, knowing Christ, it's a powerful experience, but it's a painful experience, but it's a very practical experience. Verse 11, here's more of the practicality of it. He says, you know why I'm willing to fellowship in Christ's sufferings and to be made conformable unto his death? Because if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, I might take hold of, I might seize, I might grasp what he calls here the resurrection of the dead. Now, the word resurrection in that 11th verse is not the normal word that is translated resurrection in our New Testament. In fact, <clears throat> the word translated resurrection in that 11th verse the only time this particular Greek word appears in the entire New Testament. And it is a word that literally means the out resurrection, out hyphen resurrection. If by any means I might grab hold of, I might seize the out resurrection. Why would he use a different word? Why would he only use this word one time in the New Testament? Well, in the context, I think what Paul is saying is, I desire to not only periodically, but constantly seize the power of the resurrection of Jesus living through me, something that he said he hadn't attained in verse 12. He hadn't attained to that. He had not constantly seized the power of the resurrection life of Jesus because he wasn't perfect. But that was his earnest, fervent desire. That was the ambition and goal of his Christian life. To experience on a constant basis the out-resurrection. The resurrection power of Christ in you, living his life through you, moment by moment. I mentioned Helen Rosviar, who was a medical missionary in the Belgian Congo in the 50s and the 60s. And she was there in the 1960s during the Marxist Simba rebellion. And during that awful time, she was kidnapped by a band of rebel soldiers and she was raped. And amid the anguish and the agony of that dark night, she wondered, God, how could you let this happen to me? And she said immediately, she sensed the Lord saying to her, thank you, Helen. Thank you for letting me use your body. They didn't rape you. They raped me. You see, Christ has, has no way to take the world's wrath upon himself except through us, except through his people. And they heap it upon him. And his life has to be seen in this world, and the only way it's ever seen and revealed in this world is through you and me. And this is what it means to know him. Do I have any volunteers? The fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. I'm telling you, this is stuff that is only for serious Christians. If you're a nominal Christian, and I mean save, but just coasting, this stuff isn't for you. You'll never live this. None of us will ever live this apart from God doing a work in our hearts. And the only reason I can think that by his grace I could sign up for this is because for many years now, as I said, I've been a God chaser. I've been pursuing him, that I might know him. And the more I know him, 
the more I want to be like him. And the more I want to be like him, then the more I'm willing to fellowship with his sufferings and say no to self and be made conformable to his death. The key is, do you have that one goal in life, that one ambition, knowing Jesus? We live in an information age, don't we? I mean, <laughs> you can get information on almost any topic imaginable in an instant by searching on an electronic device. But just because information is available doesn't mean it's accurate. You know, we, we've been warned like Wikipedia, anyone can put a definition of anything on that. You never know if it's if it's accurate or not. You don't know. That's the danger of of looking for Christian uh, uh, articles online. If you don't know the source of it, you could be tapping into a whole bunch of false teaching real quickly. Like so unless you already know the source uh, about the subject or the inf uh, you know the information that's being given to you, is it reliable? You're never sure of the accuracy. You know what I've come to believe? All real, genuine truth is God's. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The knowledge of the holy. But knowledge is not acquired by a mere intellectual pursuit, but it's through a right relationship with the Lord. And it's this kind of relationship that Paul is talking about here in Philippians chapter 3. So I ask you, in your heart of hearts, you want to sign up? You really want to know the Lord? Not trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Not trying to make you think it's something it's not. This is the reality of what it is to know the Lord. And if you're not interested don't pretend that you are, because this is serious business. To know the Lord is the most important knowledge in all of the world. There are people either listening to me or sitting here today that are, are miserable. If the truth were known, they may have a smile on their face, but they're miserable because they fought the Lord, because they're fighting the Lord, and they haven't submitted to him. And as a result, Deep in their heart, they're miserable. They're not happy with their life. And this is the answer. But it comes at a cost, doesn't it? Someone said that the, the entrance fee into the Christian life is zero. It's free because Jesus paid it all, right? But the annual subscription is all that you are and all that you have. Like was said this morning, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that's believers, based on the mercies of God that you're a partaker of, hand over your body, hand over your whole self, hand over yourself to God, because that is your reasonable service. That's the logical thing to do, based on the mercies of God the rich mercies that you and I are the recipients of, hand it over. Hands off yourself. Make yourself an offering to the Lord, a free will offering to him, a living sacrifice. It's real spiritual worship when you do that. That's where this knowing Christ begins. It begins by you handing yourself over and saying, Lord, I'm not my own, I'm yours. And so from here on out, I just want to know you. I want to seek you so you can do with me whatever you please. I don't care if you put me on the remotest part of the planet. I don't care if you put me in, in a place where there are no creature comforts or conveniences. I just want to make you known. I want to know you and I want other people to know you because when you know the Lord, you can't keep it to yourself. Uh, you know he, he's, he's worth sharing. You know that uh, it would be the worst thing to not share the one that you know. You want everyone to know. I always kick myself when I miss divine appointments. I missed one on Friday. I was telling my wife, I was pulling on the road, and I remember right there a guy stopped me, and he wanted to know something about uh, 
the the uh, vehicle I was driving, and I could have told him about Jesus. I could have said, "You don't really want to know about the vehicle. You want to know about the Lord." The uh, I didn't get it until after the fact. That's why we have to walk with him closely. 